All right, everyone, we're doing chapter two of Bud Not Buddy. Let's see what happens next. There comes a time when you're losing a fight that it just doesn't make sense to keep on fighting. It's not that you're being a quitter. It's just that you've got the sense to know when enough is enough. I was having this thought because Todd Amos was hitting me so hard and fast that I knew that the blood squirting out of my nose was only the beginning of a whole long list of bad things that were about to happen to me. Todd's next punch crashed into the side of my ear and I fell on the floor and pulled my knees up to my chest and crossed my arms in front of my head like a turtle in a shell. I started scooching toward the bed, hoping I could get under it. Todd started kicking me, but his slippers couldn't hurt me near as much as his fist had. The bedroom door opened and his mother, Mrs. Amos, came in. It seemed like she was having a hard time figuring out what was going on because Todd's right leg got tired from kicking me and he had switched over to his left one while she watched. Finally, Miss Amos said kind of soft, Toddy? Todd looked up, fell on his knees and put his hand on, hands on his throat. He started huffing and puffing with his eyes bucking out of his head and his chest going up and down so hard, it looked like some kind of big animal was inside of him trying to bust out. This was my chance to get under the bed and pull the covers down so they couldn't see me. Mrs. Amos ran over to her son and fell on her knees. She put her arms around his shoulders. Toddy, Toddy boy, are you all right? She looked over to where I was peeking from under the covers, under the bed. You big cur. What have you done to Toddy? Todd coughed out, Oh, mother. He took in two jumbo breaths. I was only trying to help. He was sounding like a horse that had been run too hard in the winter. And, and look what has gotten me. Todd pointed at his jaw and Mrs. Amos and me could both see a perfect print in the shape of my hand welted on Todd's blubbery cheek. With one quick snatch, she had me from under the bed and out on the floor, laying down next to Todd. How dare you? This is how you choose to repay me? Not only have you struck him, you have provoked his asthma. Todd said, I just tried to waken him to make sure he'd gone to the laboratory, mother. I was just trying to help. He aimed his finger dead at me and said, and look at him, mother. This one's got bed wetter written all over him. I'm not bragging when I say that I'm one of the best liars in the world, but I got to tell you, Todd was pretty doggone good. It seemed like he knew some of the same things I know, the things I think of all the time and try to remember so I don't make the same mistake more than seven or eight times. Shucks, I've got so many of them rem memorized that I had to give them numbers. And it seemed like Todd knew number three above Caldwell's rules and things for having a funner life and making a better liar out of yourself. Rules and things number three. If you've got to tell a lie, make sure it's simple and easy to remember. Todd had done that, but this wasn't really a good test because Mrs. Amos had her ears set to believe anything Todd said. In her eyes, Todd's mouth was a prayer book. But I can't blame Todd for lying like that. Having someone who likes you so much that they think everything you say is the truth has got to be a liar's paradise. That might feel so good, it could make you want to quit lying. But maybe not, because Todd hadn't quit lying since the second I came to his house. What had really happened was that I woke up from a good sleep because it felt like a steam locomotion had jumped the tracks and chug, chug, chugged its way straight into my nose. When I jerked up in bed and opened my eyes, Todd was standing next to me with a yellow pencil in his hand. He was looking at it like it was a thermometer and said, wow, you got all the way up to R. He turned the pencil toward me, crunched it up against the headboard. I saw Ticonderoga printed on the yellow wood. The whole room smelled like the rubber from the eraser and I was winking and blinking my left eye because it felt like something had poked the back of my eyeball. Todd laughed. I've never gotten it in as deep as the N 
on any of you other little street urchins. You just might enjoy your stay here. Who knows what other things you could be number one in, buddy? I'd already told him twice that my name was Bud, not Buddy. I didn't care that Top Amos was 12 years old. I didn't care that he was twice as big as me. And I didn't care that his mother was being paid to take care of me. I wasn't about to let anybody call me Buddy and stick a pistol up my nose all the way to the R. I swung as hard as I could at Todd's big balloon head. Somewhere between the time I threw my punch and the time it landed my fist came open and when my hand landed it made a pop like a twenty two rifle going off. Todd fell on the floor like he'd been caught cold cocked. He sputtered and muttered and felt the spot where I'd slapped him. Then a big smile came on his face and he stood up and started walking real slow toward where I was on the bed. He untied his robe and dropped it on the floor like he was getting ready to do some hard work. I jumped to the floor and got my fist up. Todd might have been a lot bigger than me, but he'd better be ready. This wasn't going to be a bird's nest sitting on the ground for him. He could kiss my wrist if he thought I was going to let him whip me up without a good fight. Being this brave was kind of stupid. Even though Todd was a puffy, rich, old mama's boy who wore a robe and slippers, he could hit like a mule and it wasn't too long before I decided enough was enough. But the story that Mrs. Amos was hearing from her lying son was only that Todd had tried to wake me up so I could go to the bathroom. Mrs. Amos hated bedwetters more than anything in the world, and my bed had a sticky, hot, smelly rubber baby sheet on it. She said it wasn't anything personal, and after I had proved myself for two or three months, I could get a proper cloth sheet. But until then, she had to protect her mattress. She pulled Todd to his feet and led him to the door. She looked over at me. You are a beastly little brute and I will not tolerate even one night with you under my roof. Who knows what you would be capable of while we slept? The, Dutch sh the door shut behind them, and I heard a key jiggle in the lock. I plugged the rice out of my nose and tried real hard to blow the smell of rubber out of the left side. The key jiggled in the lock again. This time when the door opened, Mr. Amos was standing with Mrs. Amos. He was carrying my suitcase. Uh-oh, they looked inside. I could tell because a twine that held it together had tied, was tied in a kind of knot that I didn't know. This was wrong. They promised they'd keep it safe and not look in it. They laughed at me when I made them promise, but they did promise. Boy, Mrs. Amos said, I am not the least bit surprised at your show of ingratitude. Lord knows I have been stung by my own people before. But take a good look at me, because I'm not one person who is totally fed up, but I am one person who is totally fed up with you and your ilk. I do not have time to put up with the foolishness of those members of your race, of our race, who do not want to be uplifted. In the morning, I'll be getting in touch with the home, and as much as a bad penny, you shall be returning to them. I am a woman of my word, though, and you shall not spend one night in my house. She looked at her husband. Mr. Amos will show you to the shed tonight, and you can come back in tomorrow for breakfast before you go. I do hope your conscience plagues you, because you may have ruined things for many others. I do not know if I shall ever be able to help another child in need. I do know. I shall not allow vermin to attack my poor baby in his own house. She talked like this and she wasn't even a preacher or a teacher. Shucks, she talked strange like this and she wasn't even a librarian. I only halfway listened to what Mrs. Amos was saying. I was too busy keeping my eye on my suitcase, wondering if they'd stolen anything from it and thinking about getting even. When I thought she was done talking, I reached my hand out for my suitcase, but she told Mr. Amos, oh no, we shall hold on to his beloved valuables. She laughed. This shall be our assurance that nothing comes amiss from the house and that this little animal is still here in the morning. 
he is far too attached to those treasures to go anywhere without them. Mrs. Amos was one of those grown-ups who could always think of one more thing to say. And that is not all. Before you retire to the shed, you shall go to Todd and apologize, or I shall be forced to give you the strapping of your life. I had been so worried about my suitcase that I didn't even notice the thick black razor strap hanging out of Mrs. Amos' Mrs. Amos's hand. She didn't have to worry. I'd apologize. One beating from those Amos's was enough for me. She grabbed my arm. Mr. Amos walked out of the room with my suitcase, and Mrs. Amos pulled me down the hall to Todd's room. We stood outside the door listening to Todd groan. When Mr. Amos came back, my suitcase was gone. He'd been so quick that I knew my bag couldn't be too far away. She tapped on Todd's door and said, Toddy, may we come in? Todd's groan got a lot louder. Finally, he said, Yes, mother. A choke. Cough. Come in. We opened the door, and as soon as he saw me, Todd made a real terrified, got a real terrified look on his face. He scooched up to the headboard and wrapped his arms around his head. Mrs. Amos gave me a shake and said, Well, I put my head down and started shooting apologies out like John Diligent shoots out bullets. I aimed at Todd first. I know it was wrong of me to hit you. I know you were only trying to help, and I'm very sorry for what I did. I looked at Mr. Amos. And sir, I'm sorry that I got you out of your sleep. He rolled his eyes like that was enough for him. Mrs. Amos was going to be the hardest because just like her ears were set to believe anything that came out of Todd's lips, they were set not to believe anything I said. And if I didn't lie good enough, she was going to use that strap on me. These Amoses might look like a bunch of cream puffs, but if she was anything like Todd, I bet she could pack a real wallop. And Mrs. Amos, I'm grateful for all your help. And I'm really, really sorry. I looked up and could see she needed more. If you give me another chance, I promise I'll do a whole lot better. Please don't call the home. Please don't send me back. Shucks, going back to the home was just what I wanted to do. But I was being just like Br'er Rabbit in one of the books Mama used to read to me at night when he yelled out, Please, Br'er Fox, don't throw me into the pricker, pricker patch. Please, please. This was another one of Bud Caldwell's rules and things to have a funner life and make a better liar out of yourself. Rules and things number 118. You have to give adults something that they think they can use to hurt you by taking it away. That way they might not take something away that you really do want. Unless they're crazy or real stupid, they won't take everything because if they did, they wouldn't have anything to hold over your head to hurt you with later. I stopped talking and gave Mrs. Amos a chance to jump right in. She held her hand up in my face and said, enough. Mr. Amos, give him the blanket and pillow off the bed he was in and put him in the shed. Todd said, yeah, buddy, keep a sharp eye out for the vampire bats in the shed. It was like a miracle. Todd's asthma was gone and he turned into a real chatterbox. Oh, and watch out for those spiders and centipedes, buddy. The last kid who got put in there got stung so bad, he was swole up as big as a whale when they, we got him out in the morning. I guess I didn't look scared enough because Todd kept going. The kid before that hasn't been found to this day. All that's left is that big puddle of his blood on the floor. Isn't that right, mother? Mrs. Ames said, now, Toddy, hush up. You'll just tire yourself out more. I noticed that she never denied the things Todd had said about the vampires and centipedes and spiders and puddles of blood. As I followed Mr. Amos, I kept a sharp eye out for my suitcase. 
When we got to the kitchen, the first thing I saw was that there was a double barrel shotgun leaning against the side of the icebox. I didn't have time to wonder why they'd be so scared they keep a big gun like that out in the open because I spotted my suitcase slid way under the kitchen table. I didn't let Mr. Amos know I'd seen it, but it did make me get a, a lot calmer. We went out of the back kitchen door and down the steps into the dark. We walked around to the back of the shed and he put a key in a padlock. A chain rattled, the lock came off and the door creaked open. Even though it was nighttime, there was a whole lot different, scarier kind of dark in the shed. A colder dark with more grays and more shadows. An old smell leaked out and it seemed like it was the perfect smell that all this gray could, would have. Mr. Amos nudged me and I took a baby step into the shed. He could kiss my wrist if he thought I was going to beg him and say things like, I'll do anything you folks ask me if you don't lock me up in here all alone. I squeezed my tongue between my teeth to hold it still because I know a lot of times your brain might want to be brave, but your mouth might let some real chicken sounding stuff fall out of it. I stood a little bit inside and looked around. Right under the window was a pile of stacked wood. There were a bunch of dusty spider webs in front of the little window and someone had pasted old yellow newspapers over the glass so the kids who got locked in here couldn't peek out. Mr. Amos handed me the blanket and pillow and gave me another nudge. I took two more baby steps in. I looked down at the floor. If I was like a normal kid, I would have busted out crying, but I just stood there breathing hard. It was a good thing I'd bit my tongue because I came real close to saying those stupid begging words to Mr. Amos. Right in the middle of the floor, there was a big black stain in the dirt. They really were going to make me sleep in the shed with a patch of blood from that kid who had disappeared out of here a couple of weeks ago? The floor went completely black when Mr. Amos pulled the door shut. I couldn't see it now, but I would rememorized the exact, shame, same, the exact shape the stain was in. The padlock snapped shut with the loudest click I'd ever heard. Wow, we seen Bud has really gotten into a pickle. Stay with me for chapter three. We're gonna find out what happens next. Daisy said, uh-uh, they've been invited, but my daddy said, you got to feel sorry for them. All they're eating is dandelion green soup. They're broke. Their clothes are falling off of them. Their baby's sick, but when someone took them some food and blankets, the man said, thank you very much, but we're white people. We ain't in need of a handout. When we got back to the main fire of Hooverville, we put the dishes in another box. Daisa made us turn them all upside down so if the rain got into them, they wouldn't rust. I went to the woman with my suitcase. It was in the same spot I'd left it and the knots in the twine were the kind I tie. I said, thank you very much, ma'am. She said, I told you not to worry. I went back to the big fire to sit with bugs. The mouth organ man said, I suppose you boys are going out on that train tomorrow. I said, the one for Chicago, sir? He said, that's the one. I said, yes, we are, sir. He said, well, you'd best be, you'd best get as much sleep as you can. It's supposed to be pulling out at 515, but you never know with these freights. We got in one of the shacks with some other boys. Buzz was snoring in two seconds, but I couldn't sleep. I opened my jackknife and put it under my blanket. I was thinking, Daisy's mama was right. Someone who doesn't know who their family is is like dust blowing out around in a storm. They don't really belong any one place. I started wondering if going to California was the right thing to do. 
I may not know who my family was, but I knew they were out there somewhere, and it seemed to make a whole lot more sense to think that they were somewhere around Flint instead of out west. I opened my suitcase to get my blanket. Even though I trusted the woman who guarded it for me, I checked to make sure everything was okay. I picked up the tobacco pouch that had my rocks in it and pulled the drawstring open. I shook the five smooth stones out and looked at them. They'd been in the drawer after the ambulance took Mama away, and I'd had them ever since. Someone had took a pen or something and had writ on all five of them, but it was writ in a code, so I couldn't understand what they meant. One of them said, Kent Land, Ill, 5, 10, 11. Another said, Lugo T, N, 5, 16, 11. Then there was Sturgis, M, 8, 30, 12, and Gary, N, 6, 13, 12. And the last one said, Flint, M, 8, 11, 11. I put them back in their pouch and put the, pulled the string tight. Then I pulled out the envelope that had the picture of the saggy pony at the misbegotten moon park. It was fine. Next, I counted the flyers again. All five were there. I slid all of them back except for the blue one. I held it up so it could catch some of the light from the big fire. I kept looking at the picture and wondering why this one bothered Mama so much. The more I thought about it, the more I knew this man just had to be my father. Why else would Mama keep these? I used a little trick to help me fall off to sleep. I pulled my blanket right up over my head and breathed in the smell real deep. After doing this three times, the smell of the shack and Hooverville were gone, and only the smell of the blanket was in my nose. And that smell always reminded me of Mama and how she used to read to me, read me to sleep every night. I took two more breaths and pretended I was hearing Mama reading to me about the Billy Goat's gruff or the fox and the grapes or the dog that saw his reflection in the water or some other story she checked out of the library. I could hear Mama's voice getting farther and farther away as I imagined I was in the story until finally her voice and the story all mixed into one. I'd learned that it was best to be asleep before Mama finished the story because if she got done and I was still awake, she'd always tell me what the story was about. I never told Mama, but that always ruined the fun of the story. Shucks. Here I was thinking I was just hearing something funny about a fox or a dog, and Mama spoiled it by telling me they were really lessons about not being greedy or not wishing for things you couldn't have. I took two more breaths and started thinking about the little hen that baked the bread. I heard, not I, said the pig, not I, said the goat, not I, said the big bad wolf. Then whoop, zoop, sloop, I was asleep. I started dreaming about the man with the giant fiddle. He was walking away and I kept calling him, but he couldn't look back. Then the dream got a lot better. I turned away from where Hermit E. Calloway was, and there stood Daisy Malone. I told her, I really like your dimple. She laughed and said, see you in seven years. A man screamed, get up. They're trying to sneak out early. I jumped straight up and banged my head on the top of the shack. I ran outside. It was still dark and the fire was just a pile of, pile of glowing sticks. The man was screaming at the top of his lungs, get up. They fired the engine and are fixing to take off. Bugs and the other boys came and stood next to me. Bugs said, is it a raid? Someone said, no, they're trying to sneak out before we get up. People started running all over Hooverville. Bugs said, come on, bud. Get your stuff. We got to get on that train. I folded my blanket up and put it in my suitcase and tied the twine back. I put my jackknife in my pocket and Bugs and I ran outside. I hadn't got six giant steps away when a boy stuck his head out of the door and yelled, 
Hey, Slim, is that your paper? I looked back. My blue flyer. I forgot to put it back in the suitcase. Bug said, hurry, I'll wait. I'll catch you. Go ahead. I ran back and took my flyer from the boy. Thanks a lot. I ran back out into the crowd that was tearing, tearing through the woods. There were a million men and boys running in the same direction. I didn't want to fold the flyer up, so as I was running, I slid it between the twine and the suitcase. I'd put it back inside once we got on the train. No one was talking. All you could hear were the sounds of a million feet smacking on the trail and the sound of a million people trying to catch their breath. Finally, a hiss sound started getting louder and louder, and I knew we weren't too far away. We broke out of the woods, and there in the dark sat the train. The locomotive was hissing and spitting cold black smoke into the sky. Every once in a while, a big shower of sparks would glow up from inside the dark cloud, making it look like a, giant, a gigantic genie and was trying to raise up out of the smokestack. The train went as far back as you could see. There must have been a thousand boxcars, but everyone had stopped and was just standing there watching. No one was trying to get on. I pushed my way to the front to see if I could find bugs, and I saw why everyone had stopped. There were four cop cars and eight cops standing between the crowd and the train. The cops, the cops all had billy clubs and were spread out to protect the train. The crowd kept getting bigger and bigger. One of the cops yelled, you men know you can't get on this train. Just go on back to Shantytown and there won't be no trouble. A white man said, this is the only train going west for the next month. You know we got families to feed and have got to be on it. You go get back in your cars and you'll be right. There won't be no trouble. The cop said, I'm warning you, the Flint, the Flint police are on the way. This here is private property and they have orders to shoot anyone who tries to get on this train. A man next to me said, I'd rather be shot than sit around here and watch my kids grow hungry. The cop said, this is America, boys. You're sounding like a bunch of commies. You know I can't let you on this train. I got kids to feed too and I'd lose my job. Someone yelled, well, welcome to the club, brother. It seemed like we stood looking at the cops and them looking at us for a whole hour. Our side was getting bigger and bigger and the other cops started looking nervous. The one who was doing all the talking saw them fidgeting and said, hold steady, men. One of the cops said, Jake, there's 400 men out there and more coming. I don't like these odds. Mr. Pinkerton ain't paying me enough to do this. He threw his cop hat and his billy club on the ground. Everybody froze when the train whistle blew one long time and the engine started saying, sha, sha, sha. The big steel wheels creaked a couple of times, then started moving. Four of the other cops threw their hats and billy clubs down too. The boss cop said, you lily livered rats. And it was like someone said, on your mark, get set, go. The engine was saying, sha, 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 And a million boys and men broke for the train. I got pushed from behind and fell on top of my suitcase. Someone reached down and pulled me up. I squeezed my bag to my stomach and ran. The train was going faster and faster. People were jumping on and reaching back to help others. I finally got to the tracks and was running as hard as I could. I looked up into the boss car and saw Bugs. He screamed, Bud, throw your bag, throw me your bag. I used both hands to throw my suitcase at the train. Bugs caught it and when he set it behind him, the blue flyer blew out of the twine and fluttered outside the door. But it was like a miracle. The flyer flipped over three times and landed right in my hand. I slowed down and put it in my pocket. Bugs reached one arm out and screamed, Bud, don't stop, run. I started running again, but it felt like my legs were gone. The car with Bugs in it was getting farther and farther away. 
Finally, I stopped. Bugs was leaning out the door and stopped reaching back for me. He waved and disappeared into the boxcar. A second later, my suitcase came flying out of the door. I walked over to where it landed and picked it up. Man, this was one tough suitcase. You couldn't even tell when it had been what it had been through. It still looked exactly the same. I sat on the side of the tracks and tried to catch my breath. The train and my new pretend brother got farther and farther away, chugging to Chicago. Man, I'd found some family, and he was gone before we could really get to know each other.